Out of 40 for my ability to lead, based on the test, they gave me 17 out of 40. I'd scored higher in physics tests than <laughs> 17 out of 40. And as we were wearing it, it soon became very clear to me that I'd scored the lowest mark in the entire denomination for my leadership potential. Hey friends, welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. We've got my friend Rob Wall on the show today. Rob is a speaker, writer, and coach based in the UK, and we have a great discussion on how God forms you in obscurity, what biblical leadership actually looks like, and how you can choose to frame a painful experience and actually use it as a catalyst for growth. But before we get to that interview, I wanna thank you for all the love you've given my new book, this dream is not for you. Now, by the time this episode is out, the book will have been out for almost a month. And so if you're a regular listener of the podcast or you watch on YouTube, you've already heard why I think you should get the book. But I wanted to share some perspectives from other people who've recently read it. In fact, I've got two short reviews uh, that I recently got on Amazon that I wanna share with you. The first is from Kate and Kate writes, I would put this book in the top 10 most impactful faith-based books I've read in the last several years. Wade honestly and vulnerably shares his journey of trusting God, even when some of his biggest dreams seem to be fading right before his eyes. He has an incredibly poignant discussion on the dangers of allowing our dreams to define us, and even worse, define God. One of my favorite quotes is, if your dream defines you, it will ultimately devastate you. Please, please take a few days to read this book if you're discouraged, disappointed, or doubting whether God is still doing significant work through your life. Now, Samantha says this, the excitement to have this book in my hands is real. It comes at a timely point in my life as I changed careers and found myself thinking, where did my dream go? And how do I continue to dream? Wade's book is a gift in bringing perspective to your story, hope to your situation, and surrender to the Lord in the season you're in. I've been blessed by Wade's vulnerability, his wisdom, and his genuine care for people to live the life God has created them for, to be a disciple of Jesus. This book is a must for anyone looking for ways to dream again. Thank you, Kate and Samantha, for those incredibly kind words about the book. And I love that last bit that Samantha wrote where she said that this book helps you live the life God has created you for, to be a disciple of Jesus. And that's my prayer for all of you. So I want you to have the same experience in your own heart and with your own dream that Kate and Samantha have had. So you can get the book wherever books are sold, and you can also find the link in the show notes or the YouTube description. So go ahead, get your copy. And if you've read the book, please consider leaving a review yourself. It helps get the word out about the book. It encourages me. And you can also get one for a friend who you think needs this message. All right, now let's join my conversation with Rob Wall. Rob, welcome to Dreamers and Disciples. It's good to have you here. Wade, thanks so much for having me. I've been excited about spending some time with you uh, all the way from the UK. So uh, so great to, to join you. From across the pond. From across the pond, London boy, London based. So uh, yeah, come over to the US quite a lot, but I I'm yet to meet you in the flesh, Wade. So next time, next time. Next we'll make time it you're happen. in Charlotte. Let me, let me ask you this. Have, have you been in Charlotte before? You know what? I've been in Charlotte 10 times. I, I've had two tattoos done in Charlotte. You really? Know, yeah, two two tattoos on my arm. I've got my my wedding ring tattooed on my arm as well. Oh, sorry, on my finger as well in Charlotte. So, yeah, I was Charlotte about to say, has if a wedding ring was tattooed on your arm. That'd be next <laughs> level. <laughs> yeah, I probably still wouldn't be married now. But uh, yeah, Bernadette and I both decided when we went to Charlotte, let's both get some tattoos, and we found a tattoo parlor downtown, and the rest is history. I'm inked. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How does how does Charlotte compare to to London? Because uh, I would think that it's a lot more boring than London. Yeah. So London, 11, 12 million people. I think New York, uh, Charlotte, much more um, small town feel, and yet the hospitality and the kindness is 
unmatched. So whenever Bernadette and I hypothetically talk about moving to America, Charlotte always makes it into the top five. Uh, so, oh, wow. so we love we love Charlotte, and I'm looking forward to getting back there at some point, some point soon for sure. All right, that means your next podcast interview it can be live in the flesh. That'd be- That'd be awesome. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, uh, let's jump in because there's you are um, a man uh, of many talents, of many interests, and there's a lot of different directions that this conversation can go. But I always start with this one question. What are you dreaming about right now? That's amazing. That's an amazing question. I, I think for me, I'm really dreaming about the way that I the gifts, the talents, the skills God's given me, how I can influence and impact a culture that would never set foot within the walls of a church. And I've I've really tried to give language to this Wade. And I think there are three there are three things that I need to do personally for that dream to become a ra- reality. And and the first one is I, I need prophetic revelation. I need continual intercession. And I need a marketplace mission. And I can do the second one, the continual intercession, but God's got to give the revelation so I can run with it. And then he's got to give me the mission or as Paul talks about my metron, my circle of influence so I can go and the people have ears to hear. So really that's my um, my passion, my dream right now, getting in spaces and places I've no business being in, but it's going to be fueled and undergirded with the foundation of revelation and intercession. I love that. And that that's a great place for us to start because I'd like to ask, when did this revelation for you come about having a marketplace mission? Because I know a little bit of your background and it was in the church uh, in the UK. So when did you start to get that burden to take the message beyond your your tradition beyond mm. your your background or your experience. Walk us through that transformation. Yeah, so so people can catch the context. I was a Church of England vicar, which is our established church here. It was charismatic, evangelical, Pentecostal type church, but it was still uh, institutional institutional nonetheless. And um, during COVID, I just felt a real burden to resource leaders with content, with coaching my communication. And I kept getting people say, look, you're a leader of leaders. And I thought, I don't really know what that means because by nature, I'm heavily introverted. Uh, I would say like on the spectrum, like 95% introverted, I could spend all day with myself. Um, I've had to really work and grow into moving out of that. Uh, but yeah, just these little whispers and hints like you're a leader of leaders. And I would say it's been a gradual progression where God sent me literally the best in the field in the areas of coaching and leadership to train me and develop me as my desire for this has grown. So so I think they're not separate preaching in the church and communicating in culture. I think there's like this thread woven throughout all of it, which is a desire to bring transformation. So Hmm. it's not been an immediate, wow, Rob, now you're going into the world to coach. It's been this incremental as I mentioned earlier, revelation and fueled with the intercession, it's birthed this mission in me. And I'm just really excited about it. But but to j- just share a quick story, if I'm a May Wade, like I have in many ways no business being in the area and arenas I, I'm in. I, I remember being ordained a pastor and three months into being ordained, every single leader in my denomination gathered for some training, some leadership training. And we had to take a test that was scored out of 40 to determine our leadership ability. And we did the test and then we were told we had to go up to the front, pick a piece of card up from a table, which had our score on it. And it had a hole punch through the card with some um, string. And then we had to wear our score around our chest so that everyone could see what our score was. And everyone was getting their scores, you know, 35 out of 40, 38 out of 40. You knew who the charismatic big leaders were. And because my name W's at the bottom of the alphabet, I was last to get my card and I picked it up. And man, I was shocked. I thought maybe turn it around the other way up. There must've been a mistake. (laughs) 
out of 40 for my ability to lead based on the test, they gave me 17 out of 40. I'd scored higher in physics tests than <laughs> 17 out of 40. And as we were wearing it, it soon became very clear to me that I'd scored the lowest mark in the entire denomination for my leadership potential. And I kind of see the irony that now I'm mentored by one of the greatest leadership coaches in the world because on my own, I'm unqualified. On my own, I have no business being in these spaces, but I think I've utilized my uniqueness and focused on my strengths, which enabled me to have some favor and breakthrough in areas because on my own, Wade, and this isn't false British humility, on my own, I'm really not that impressive, but with the dependence on God, he's opened doors that I could never have opened. And I'm just walking in and excited about, you know, each day where he takes me next. I love that you shared that story because I feel like that had to be a pretty devastating experience to, to get the lowest score in your denomination. And you have to flaunt that in front of everybody. You can't, you can't hide it. Yeah. And, and that's not a story in isolation. So rewind to when I was seven years old, first time I ever get up to do a public presentation, I lose my speech, uh, my mouth gets dry and I couldn't get the words out. And I'm laughed off the platform from contemporaries. And some of you will be able to connect with that who are listening. And then I was scared of public speaking essentially for several years. So with that as the backdrop to suddenly be told after my calling's been confirmed by the church, after I've been ordained, that actually your capacity to lead is going to be stunted. It's then you've got a choice, I think. And what I chose to do was allow it to be fuel for me to get, no want of a better word, obsessed with personal growth. Mm -hmm. um, I locked myself away for five years listening to six sermons a night. I gleaned and read every leadership book there is to learn. I got leadership mentors and coaches and then just started leading things myself. And I realized my growth, as Carol Dweck talks about, wasn't fixed. It was actually um, at its baseline and it was up to me to determine whether I could grow. So for me, I've, I'm a product of how personal growth today make sure tomorrow is much better. Which isn't that, I mean, the response you just described is like the, the best case scenario of how you can respond to something like that. Was that reaction immediate for you or did it take some time to get there? Can you walk us through whatever gap there was? Yeah. So generally I have a principle and I try to live my life by this, the 24 hour rule no matter what happens, whether it's a celebration or something that's caused devastation, I'll give my 20, set myself 24 hours to feel it, to learn the lessons and to move on. And that helps me because I'm such a feeler, like I'm, I'm very intuitive. I'm not really a, a logical guy. So if I'm not careful, I could sit with something a long time. So having that principle in place, serves me really well. And so that's the first thing I, I kind of don't dwell on things too long, but then I thought to myself, it can only really get better from here because I've been called, I've been called as a pastor and there are very many different expressions of being a pastor. So, um, it kind of widens my view of what the pastor role is. It doesn't just have to be the charismatic, um, guy at the front, which is needed, but it's not always that style that everyone connects with. So for me, I learned that there was potential and hope in, in the devastation, but it wasn't easy. I'm not going to, yeah, it, it was hard for a few months. And then of course your contemporaries, this is a life lesson. Your contemporaries always remember that moment. So there'll be people now that look at me and think I must be really misunderstood. And the fact that they're thinking, oh, he mustn't have seen that scorecard properly because he shouldn't be doing <laughs> what he's doing. But but just because just because they're misunderstood does not mean that you yourself have had a misunderstanding. Hmm. And you've got to and and to 
to use the David and Goliath illustration, Eliab and his brothers, they, they, they have their armor and it works for them. But what's a help for them can be a hindrance to you. And you asked me about the gap that was created. A lot of people don't live to see the relevance of their slingshot. Meaning your slingshot only becomes relevant when you meet your Goliath. And there are giants in culture, in our personal lives and in our relationships that aren't falling because we're too easily discouraged when people question our motives rather than us getting the revelation from God himself. So last thing I'd say as a preacher, I used to listen to six talks every day. And my Evernote is no exaggeration, filled with thousands of quotes and articles and stories. But for the last year, Wade, I have not listened to a single sermon. Because catch this, it's been borrowed revelation. Hmm. It doesn't matter how anointed the person that said it is, it was their revelation for the people. They've come down off the mountain and given it to us and served it us in a brilliant, remarkable way. But I needed to get in the book for myself. And I've just been getting revelation that I always knew could come when you're on your own with Christ. But actually the discipline of shutting off all other voices has equipped and enabled me to mature in my faith because now I know the revelation I'm sharing isn't borrowed, but it's been received. Yeah, that's I mean, it can become so easy or it's so easy to become just a mimic or a copycat of everyone you're learning from. And I think the growth and maturity happens when you can take all that and then allow it to help shape who you really are. Mm. and become a more fully realized version of who God has gifted you to be. So how do you balance that with, okay, you're wanting to, to not borrow anymore. You're wanting to get your own revelation, but then there's also that need to be in community and church, which also involves people preaching. How are you balancing those, those two things? Yeah. So I think you've got to, <clears throat> I, I, I want to say categorize it. So not every revelation I receive is for me to then pass on and preach to others. Sometimes the revelation is just for me mm-hmm. and to build me up. And so I'm inspired, I'm edified, but I very rarely now pass on that revelation um, when I'm preaching. But yeah, categorizing it really helps me because sometimes I naturally as preachers, we will all say things that's borrowed from somebody else, you know, that we didn't realize, or we've said differently. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, and of course, any fresh revelation we get in the scripture, we've got to test it against everything that's already been said in the past. So, so I'm not saying isolate ourselves in study and education, but I do think that there's a different kind of potency and power that comes from God speaking directly to you than you hearing Chinese whispers from somebody else. Hmm. Contrarian thought, but but it's really it's really helped and and built yeah. me up. At, and actually, my preaching's improved as I've come. Miles Davis says it takes a lifetime to find your voice. Yeah, I mean, I've been on a journey, you know, for for several years. Even when I was still on staff at Elevation, I'm trying to figure out my voice because it mm. w- it was so easy to compare myself to Pastor Stephen. I bet. Yeah. And which is not a fun thing to do (laughs) when you've got somebody that just insanely gifted at communicating and my style, my gift, my personality, all of that is so different. And Mm. for the longest time, I would just be like, oh, I'm, I'm no good because I'm not like that. And I began to realize though that because I wasn't like that, I had a uniqueness that I could bring to the platform that was different and that was refreshing in the few times mm. that I would be able to preach. Yeah. And the more in this season I've learned to lean into that uniqueness, to lean into preaching the way I talk, preaching the way my personality is, um, mm. it's really unlocked a whole lot of joy in doing it. Um, the fact that I have to manuscript my sermons and I'm not as spontaneous. I used to hate that about myself. Now I enjoy the fact that I can get precise about my Mm. language and precise about what I'm trying to communicate. So, but I still have so much further to go. 
as a mm. preacher, as a communicator. And so, yeah, the fact that it's a lifetime journey on one hand is very encouraging. On the other hand, I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> um, I've got so much more work to do. Yeah, and I think it was at an Elevation Conference, pastors even said the hardest thing about preaching is there will always be that gap between um, your expectation of how you are to deliver it and the reality of your execution. And uh, I just, that's always stuck with me. Like if I come off um, a platform thinking, oh, that was, I'm done. I've made it as a speaker communicator. Then that, then I'm in trouble because uh, I don't even think there is such a thing as a perfect sermon, but I think constantly growing into the next level of your abilities is essential. Yeah. I want to go back to that five year period where you said you were just consuming as much leadership material as you could. Did that feel like a time of obscurity for you? Did it feel like you were in a sense being passed over for other opportunities as you were in the laboratory of your own soul and your own mind? Describe what that was like for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my, one of my favorite quotes ever is Charles Spurgeon, if I had 25 years left to live, I'd spend 20 years in preparation. And another British preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, said uh, the worst thing that can happen to a person is for them to succeed before they are ready. And there were glimpses. I, like you, I worked at a mega church for several years. There were always glimpses that I had the gift of communicating, but they were always glimpses. And I always thought that the platform I had would be like pregnant with a, with a, to birth another opportunity. But no, it was very much five years of, um, you're going to get a glimpse of what this could look like one day, but your character is certainly not in a place right now that could sustain, you could sustain all the praise, but you can sustain the persecution that will come with it. Mm. And so I got my head down and, in those moments, I found I was really discouraged, wanting to be discovered, and God was developing me. God would send a voice of encouragement along just to say, keep going. And it felt like five years of just when I thought this is never going to happen, <laughs> a voice would come along and just say, in God's timing, it will keep happening. So I think they're the most necessary periods of our life. But when you're in them, they seem so negative and and more growth goes on in those hidden seasons than we than we realize. And I, I do think if you cultivate a really strong secret prayer life during that time, one of my favorite quotes is that a strong, healthy, secret place cannot be hidden for long. Hmm. I love that. And you that who, just came, who said that? Uh, Rob Wall. <laughs> oh, that's your <laughs> <laughs> Rob Wall. Um, yeah, it just came to me recently, like a, a strong, secret, healthy, hidden place cannot be hidden for long. And I, I, I'm not saying that's why we do it, but as a byproduct, we will always um, re release what's been revealed to us and we become like we behold. And all those pithy sayings that we can bypass are actually um, the well upon which we, we draw from daily. So I'd also say when you're growing and being developed, a lot of people will be attracted to you but I've learned also a lot of people will be agitated and irritated by you. Let me explain. So yes, we're a sweet smelling aroma pleasing to God and we'll naturally attract a certain type of person when they see our personality, gifts and skills. But what we're not taught about so much in church is the affliction of the anointing. I'm going, going deep here. I'm not trying to be mystical and not Gnostic, but there's very much a, a sense in which we prepare you for the blessing, but not the burden that comes with the anointing. Having a conversation with someone and they can't make eye contact with you because because the light that is on you is so bright. You know, imagine being in a dark room 24-7, suddenly someone opens the door, you instantly want to sh sh like hide. And, and people, when they encounter Christ or someone carrying Christ, they often are convicted or don't know how to react. And, and I found that being developed in like secret places has equipped me to really deal with, with that aspect of anointing as well. And, you know, yeah, that's some deep, some deep subjective thoughts there, but I, I do think that was a big part of my preparation. The nuances, mm -hmm. all the subliminal underneath messages that, that we're not really taught um, that we can misunderstand because we haven't been taught about it. 
getting what you want or getting what you're praying for or preparing for, it always has a cost to it that you don't fully appreciate until you're in it. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think God in his grace and in his mercy allows us to get in a position to, to sacrifice what it will cost or to pay what it will cost when we're ready for it. Yeah, you know, there are no breakthroughs at bargain prices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there just aren't. And I think there's a new price to pay every, every single season, I think. New sacrifice to be made. Yeah, and we try to rush into those breakthrough seasons not yeah. realizing what it will require of us. You know, we, we've mentioned the word breakthrough. We've talked about preparation before being noticed for what God has been developing within you. What about the people and the seasons of life where you feel like, because not everybody's going to have a breakthrough onto a platform. Not everybody's going to have this preaching ministry, this massive social media following. Most people are living day in and day out, going to work, providing for their family, loving their neighbor. And they might have a dream for something beyond that, but it's never fully realized. What would you say to that person who feels like, ah, oh, there's so much more in me and I feel like I'm being held back? Wow, great question. <clears throat> I think purpose has a lot to do with, with how we interpret our seasons. So how, how assured are we of the purpose we have in our present? So uh, my, my wife, Bernadette, for example, she's, she's started her own business, but she's looking after our two and four year old every single day. Uh, well, Gracie's gone to school now, but before, you know, she was looking after them and something as simple for her as when she was putting, um, I, I think the name's the same in the U S but you know, the, the balls from like the, the ball pit, you know, you get all those balls uh -huh. in. The, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Joshua puts them all over the room every day, maybe three or four times. And Bernadette started to think, you know, I'm called to write. I'm called to teach. I am a pastor. And here I am day after day, putting in these balls in, in the ball pit. And then one day she just had this revelation. She was like, today is my, I'm in my purpose right now. It just doesn't look like I thought it would look. So what she started to do is she'd take one of the balls and there were like a hundred of them. And every time she picked one up and put it in the pit, she called someone to mind and just started praying for them. And you think that's a hundred, that's a hundred balls going in every single time. And she just found such contentment and assurance by being present in the present that it didn't mean she'd stopped focusing on the future goals and desires, but she knew that not only does the Lord order our steps, but the Lord gives us the desires of our hearts. And the biggest, the biggest in accident with that verse is we assume desires of our hearts is God giving us what we feel like. But actually desires of the heart in the original language means to allow God to redesign the desires mm -hmm. of your heart so you align his will with what you want. And suddenly there's authority in your assignment today because there's submission, trusting that he's got your tomorrow. And so Bernard, that's just a beautiful story, I think, mm. of someone that's in that gap between what they want to see and what they do see, and yet finding purpose in the present, because who you are today is preparing you to become who you need to be when you are doing something. And it might not be at a bigger level, but there'll always be, I find that, and I'm sure, sure you find this as you go on in life, the consequences of your decision become weightier and greater. Mm -hmm. And so it pays to pay and work on your character now because the repercussions of every decision are different in your 40s than in, in your 20s. That's such a beautiful picture of reframing something that is one of your greatest frustrations and annoyances and then leveraging it to help keep your purpose more front and center, to leverage it towards prayer, and even to take every thought captive and transform it. I, th I think that's such a practical thing that everyone listening can take from this. And it might not be putting balls back into a ball pit, but what is the thing that currently is a trigger for, for frustration that you can then leverage as a trigger for prayer? So true, yeah. And, and you know, the key word I think, Wade, is abiding. And if, 
we're to honor the greatest commandment, then wherever we are, whatever we're doing, as long as we're loving Christ and loving our neighbor, um, let's not get too caught up on the on the where. I, I love Jack Hayford. He says, in all our pursuit of God's promises, let us never forget the promiser. Hmm. Because all the promises are, is an arrow pointing us back to Jesus. So yes, pray for the career, pray for the friendship group, pray for the husband, pray for the child. But in all our pursuits of the blessings, the blesser must always remain front and center because if we're saved by grace through faith, we already have eternal riches that if we dwell on, it should stir up a delight in us. Now, I want to turn the corner a little bit towards Mm. leadership because you talk a lot about leadership, you coach a lot on leadership. You've been mentored by John Maxwell, probably the greatest leadership coach alive today. Mm. And, but I feel like at, at, at this point, it feels like everyone wants to be a leader, but we're seeing a lot of repercussions from people who maybe didn't understand fully what leadership is meant to be in the kingdom of God. Mm. What are you seeing right now in the church and the business world as you work with leaders that is a blind spot that you can help us with right now? Wow. That's a huge question. I, I think in my, in my experience, ministering leadership in the, uh, cultures and the world is a lot easier right now. I feel than leading in the church. In, in the church, yes, because when you come in as a light into a dark space, it, it is it is quite potent, and people can easily sense something different. And people are drawn to values based leadership from the Bible. It, you might not use the language of the Bible, but people are draw people are on board with your principles. The church we have this fine line where we know we need to be led, but at the same time, we have sometimes taken earthly business principles and placed them at the forefront of how to lead a church or an organization. And you look at Jesus's model of discipleship and actually oftentimes it can be very, very different. Now, we could could have a whole day talking about the differences there, but for me, I think people are longing for that balance of being led well with vision, but not at the detriment and the cost of losing people. Go deeper on that. Does the vision have such preeminence that we're willing to lose people that need to be loved, that need to be served, but they don't necessarily fit the culture So for us, we interpret them as culture vultures and lovingly ask them to leave. I've been a part of several large churches and I parachute in and preach and pop out. And one thing I, I think for all the people that come on board with a massive vision and love it, we don't hear the stories about the war wounds that appear from those that were left behind. And so I think the biggest challenge for us with great leadership, huge vision is to figure out how we lovingly serve those that clearly aren't going to flourish in our culture, that aren't going to thrive with this vision. How can we make sure that we're displaying servant leadership, Christ-like leadership to those that are clearly not not meant to be part of the journey? That, that for me, I think is the biggest challenge because I've, I've even done internship groups um, with, with people that have come from big churches and every single one of them was wounded and I don't think the leaders would ever would ever know. And so for me that's that's the challenge. How do we do that? And may, maybe you'll be able to give the answer away because I'm not sure I know. <laughs> I'm not sure I know. <laughs> well I, I mean I think it goes back to to what you briefly mentioned of the way Jesus talks about leadership is very different than the way the world does. And in fact Jesus doesn't talk about leadership that much. He talks more about serving. And so I, I'd love for you to, to maybe help us live in that tension for a second of, yes, the church needs godly leaders. The world needs godly leaders. 
But more than anything else, we see in Jesus, someone who models leading through serving. And so how do we, how do we do that well? How do we do that well? Well, well, one of my favorite, and I, I don't know who said this, but I do think when, when we emphasize picking up towels instead of focusing on titles, that's the first step for us to get that attitude of servant leadership. We could get hung up on the word leadership. If we, if we remove the word leadership for a moment, anyone that can influence another person to, on its baseline level, how are we doing that well? Uh, and I, I think there needs to be more teaching and resourcing on what Jesus actually did and how he actually influenced others as opposed to, you know, what can happen when leadership isn't done well. Cause, cause I think we're seeing, as I said, we're seeing, we're seeing wounds right, left and center of people that are falling short. So yeah, I don't think I've got a comprehensive like answer for it, but I do think, yeah, serving with towels has got to be the, the first port of call. Yeah. And I like the way you framed it with influence because when you look at it from that respect, we all have influence over someone or multiple people. There's always someone looking to you, whether you're aware of it or not. So in that respect, how do we influence them along the lines of how Christ would call us to do that as his disciple? And I think that helps frame the conversation in a way that's not mm. just pertinent to pastors. It's not just pertinent to a CEO. It's pertinent to every single person that's listening to this. Yeah, so for me, I think the attitude of humility must be the starting place. Uh, and we need to harness an ability to embrace diversity. If you think about Christ's ministry for Jew and Gentile, he modeled something that we don't see enough of. I don't see enough of it in, in places I am, but just that diversity of surrounding yourself with people that look nothing like you so that you can learn from them and not feel like you've got a dogma and a truth that is absolute, but instead be like, okay, I can learn something from you. You can learn something from me. It's not one person. This is going to the leadership question. It's not one person that has the divine revelation and our job and our role on the planet is to be the ones that carry that out. No, oftentimes in community, we get different facets of Christ, different revelation from Christ, different gifts in the body of Christ. And so when I see that diversity, that's not only a picture of heaven, every tribe, every tongue bowing at the name of Jesus, but that also safeguards us and keeps us accountable from one person telling us how things should be and instead having a diverse group of people that say, based on my age, stage and race, this is what Christ wants to speak to the church. Do you have ears to listen? Yeah. What would you say is the most challenging leadership lesson you've learned from John Maxwell? The one that's been hardest for you to implement? Wow. The hardest one to implement. I think that we all want to be where certain people are without doing what certain people have done. And so when I know that John Maxwell's up at 4.30 every single morning in his 70s still writing and thinking for an hour through his meetings and intentionally thinking, who am I going to add value to through my leadership today? And then blocking out with discipline his calendar till 11 a.m. before he even meets anyone and commits his life to personal growth still now in his 70s. I'm challenged with, okay, I know what you've done consistently. Have I got, not have I got it in me to do it, but do I want to cultivate, to cultivate the disciplines to do it? And for me, that's, that's the whole thing. You know, does my audio align with my video? <laughs> does my walk align with my talk? And, and I think they're the moments. It's the small things. The other thing I'd say is he's the master at just honoring the small commitments. He's the master at the little things that often we'll think just don't matter. Like he, he's never canceled a mentoring call with me in five years. Every month he calls me the same time. He's never canceled in five years. Out of 9,000 speaking engagements, he's canceled one. And so for me, I think, because it's so basic, I hesitate to say it, but the consistency in the simple 
is for me something, that's why he's done what he's done and been trusted with what he's been entrusted with. I, I've got to ask myself, I've seen it. I've been exposed to it. So I can't ignore it and pretend I haven't seen it. Am I willing to reflect that? Or am I going to do what many of us do, still be addicted to information, gleaning, eating more information, addicted to information, but allergic to execution? Because wait, on paper, I don't need to read anything else about, I know cult, uh, trends shift and change and you've got to be up to date, but on paper, there's nothing more to read on leadership, really. There's nothing more like out there that hasn't been read. If I'd applied everything I, I know, I think I'd be, I'd be happy, but that's the challenge, isn't it? Applying. Hmm. It's easier for me to, be, to get more information and think I'm progressing rather than applying what I already know. Addicted to information, allergic to execution. Yeah. I mean, that sums up so much of our culture right now. We love to just take in podcasts and books and which are all good things, great resources, but everyone's looking for that one secret that if they just do this one thing, it's going to change their life. When in reality, what you just said is it's the daily steps of faithfulness, the daily steps of consistency that actually build you your character, build you into the person that's actually going to be able to make a difference. Yeah. And, and please, please disagree with me, Wade, if you don't agree with this, but there's also a part of me that thinks the sovereignty of God has to, has to be brought into this conversation. Cause let's say, let's use Pastor Stephen, for example, I could try and copy everything he's ever done and move to Charlotte and copy the sermons and try and find my Wade and my Chunks and my LB and, and Larry Hubeka and, and everyone. And it wouldn't work for me simply because that's not my calling and that wasn't my anointing. And so I think we need to free ourselves sometimes of thinking, if I do this step, like conferences are amazing to replenish, refuel, be fed. But I think sometimes we think if I do the steps, mm -hmm. then I'll get that result. And actually surrendering, it's kind of like your book, you know, surrendering to, to God's plan and dream for you. To me, that, that's weightier than, than ticking all the boxes, getting all the notes in a conference, trying to apply it, and then realizing um, it's not going to work for me because that's not my, my call. Oh, I agree with that 100%. Because I, I think we spend so much time chasing a result and yeah. chasing someone else's breakthrough that we never surrender to the process of becoming who Christ has called us to become in him. And I think that is that once again, that happens through consistency. It happens through consistent showing up in prayer, consistent, loving your family, loving your community. It's consistent trust in God and the disappointments of failed dreams. Mm -hmm. It's consistency and all the, it's not perfection because none of us can measure up to that, but it's consistently bringing our heart to Jesus and our successes and our failures and still mm. taking one step forward. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You're spot on. I think we also, I, I, this is going to sound a bit morbid, but, but something a coach taught, a high performing coach taught me was, um, he sometimes just reads the eulogies in the paper. And I was like, why do you do that? That's a bit morbid. He was like, no, no, because, you know, come up with a tombstone statement. Like, how, how do you want to be remembered? And you're going to realize the people that have really impacted your life are not the ones that preached the sermon. They gave you memorable moments, but they didn't shape you the way, for example, the only reason I ever came back to church was because a guy called Dan remembered my name on the second week. And he's standing at the back and I don't think anyone knows who he is, but yeah, every time I get up to preach, it's as if he's standing next to me because he did such a significant thing. And, and I know in God's eyes, he's saying, well done, Dan, good and faithful servant. But in the world's eyes, they don't know him. He doesn't have followers. He doesn't have fans. And so I try, that's really the genesis, the beginning of my ministry, his, his obedience in the simple. Trying to remember that helps me to redefine success. Um, which isn't easy, but I try, I try to let that trigger the small things being as weighty as the big things. What do you do on those moments where 
you know the right definition for success, but you're frustrated because you can't hit your own personal, maybe more worldly definition of success. Do you understand what I'm asking? What do you do in the moments where there's not consistency between what you know you should want and what you actually want? Yeah, I, I'm a, I, I like the, the balance of doing things myself that can put boundaries in place to stop that. So the simple things like getting off social media. Now I only use social media to post. I don't scroll or look through it because I just don't. I'm in a season where I'm focusing on on me, not, not focusing on how what I do can speak to the wider conversation of, of big ministry. So, so the first thing I do is I'll, I'll get off socials. Um, that's a big help. Uh, as a safeguard. And then I just remember, you know, every problem I have with regards to success and where I'm at is a result of me imposing a deadline on God's timeline. And you know what, Wade? He never agreed the deadline date that I set. I think when I was called to ministry, I remember watching a Judah Smith sermon and crying my eyes out in my parents' bedroom. And it's silly. I thought, you know, I'll be preaching by next week. And I had this vision of speaking in front of a big auditorium. Um, but he, sh he showed me the palace, but he didn't show me that my brother's pit throwing me in a pit. He didn't throw show me the palace. He didn't show me Potiphar's wife. He didn't show any of that stuff. And I think every time I get discouraged, I got to remember who told me it was going to be hmm. so swift and easy like who it's almost coaching myself with the power of the spirit like speaking to me um but it's, it's daily surrender i think because i i don't think i've spoke to anyone even highly successful people who would say they are where they want to be right now because yeah. success never looks like success that is so true you never feel like you've attained it no matter how successful you are in the other in other people's eyes yeah and i just one more thing wait i just finished this book by um uh venture capitalist who, who was worth 400, 500 million at the end of his career in London. And the end of the book, he'd lost his health. He had missed his children growing up. And he said, I've, I've earned 450 million. I've been part of making some of the biggest deals in the world. And yet if I could get the time back and go back to the beginning and remember what my priorities are, I wouldn't be in this state. I thought, what a devastating thought. Incredibly gifted, incredibly influential, incredibly rich, but not wealthy. Hmm. And I think, you know, success is not significance and, and external validation is, is, is richness, but true wealth. Does your family love you? Do you have your reputation? Do your friends respect you? Are you being true to yourself? A lot of us feel insecurity because we've betrayed our, our most important values, I think. And so one question I'd ask your listeners is, are your proclaimed values aligning with your visible practices? Can I look at your calendar and see that your family is your priority? Because as the saying goes, with, without a demonstration, the declarations are empty. Are your proclaimed values aligned with your visible practices. Mm. That's such a great application from this. And I, I want to ask you, actually, there's something that you posted on social media maybe several weeks ago, and you made this statement. Every Christian should read the first century disciples' lives. It redefines risk and sets the standard for sacrifice. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, Well. well, I mean... The first century Christians, uh, I know this isn't a theology lecture, but if you read any theology from the first century, you know how, like today, ridiculous it would be that these first century Jews have decided to follow a little sect of Christianity and follow a guy that has promised a kingdom that's not coming by military might, that's not coming by overthrowing Rome and Caesar, but a kingdom that's come in humility and resulted in his crucifixion. So, so the first thing I'd say is you have this group of people that have bet everything on following this guy and believing that he is who he said he is because of the resurrection. That is important because they had such assurance of the resurrection 
and of Jesus rising from the dead, that they were willing to risk their lives and die for the cause themselves. And so when I think about a disciple being put in hot water and burnt alive or Peter being crucified upside down, suddenly me feeling a little bit upset that the guy down the road didn't agree with me that I thought marriage was a covenant, not just a contract, doesn't have the same kind of weight to it. And you could say, oh, they were different times culturally, Rob. Well, well no, they're very similar times. There were so many competing demands and, and belief systems and the Greeks and the Romans and the Epicureans, you know, you know we can go into it. But, but ultimately, they believed so strongly in their convictions that Christ rose from the dead, that that gave them the confidence to, to release their life. And application for us, I just wonder whether we need to reassess, re-audit what sacrifice really means today. When it comes down to it, is there anything that you would go to the stake for? Deep, heavy question, but but I think it's important because that will shape everything we say, every belief, every behavior. And um, we might come to a time, Wade, we might come to a time in the future where we need to reassess what sacrifice is and what we need to do to stand for Christ in the midst of it. I mean, I, th I think it's a it's an important and necessary question for discipleship, mm. but it's one that most, there's a lot of people on this planet that are confronted with that question daily. But for many of us, especially in the West, we, we don't really have to think about that. So even going back to your question of, you know, your your priorities and your practices or your values and your practices being in alignment, first century Christians, they kind of had, if you said you were a Christian, then that practice couldn't get you killed. And so you had to make sure that there was a wholeheartedness to it, mm -hmm. where now it is so much easier to have um, them being out of alignment. And so I think it's it's all part of one conversation of what, I mean, the way you phrased it, what are you willing to go to the stake for? I mean, that that's a pretty powerful question. Yeah, and I'd, I'd go as far as say it's an extreme end of the <clears throat> conversation, but less extreme. You know, a lot of us believe that we put our faith in Jesus, we've got our meal ticket to heaven, and so really what we do on earth now, as long as, long as our salvation's secure, um, we're, we're going to be okay. But, but actually resurrection is a much fuller thing than us ra being raised with Christ one day. Resurrection is God's inbreaking kingdom in heaven coming to earth right now. And so what am I willing to sacrifice today so glimpses of that kingdom can be revealed in my everyday living? How can that Starbucks I buy for the single mother behind me show a glimpse of the love of Christ in a world where all she knows is gossip, comparison, and that sense of not feeling enough? You can usher in the kingdom today by believing resurrection, <clears throat> excuse me, isn't just pie in the sky when you die, but steak on the plate as you wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I feel like this is a, it's a weighty question. Mm to end on, but I like letting people kind of sit with this um, of what does discipleship really look like? What are you willing to sacrifice for the cause of Christ, for what you value, for your family, for what you believe God has called you to do? Mm. But most importantly, all centered around Jesus, Him being the prize, Him being the foundation, Him being the cornerstone of everything. Before we close though, is there anything that's on your heart that you want to speak either to further that or to circle back on something we've said? Yeah, I think what I'm being led to do in this season, Wade, is um, not develop the, the competencies, not try and increase my circle of influence, not knock on doors for opportunities, but um, a very strong sense of a call to consecration. A set, you know, big word, but to be set apart. And for me, and it will express itself in different forms for different people, but for me right now that's coming in the question, how committed am I to prayer? 
So there's a guy called Joshua Selman that said, and I've it's just stuck with me. Um, he quotes Amos 5 verse 1, which is, woe to you who has become complacent. And then he said, the great prayers are prayed and the great prayers are answered whilst men sleep. And he was talking about how, how are you a watchman on the wall for your family for an hour a day in prayer? Are you a witness to what God's doing in the secret place in the early hours of the morning? Uh, and I was thinking, well, I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old. No, I, I'm enjoying my sleep because I'm going to be woken up in three hours. But when we go back to that sacrifice question, I've got to ask myself if he did, um, if I did see, feel that prompt to wake up in the early hours, would I obey it? And I think it's all. Hy- I think it is hypothetical. It's me just asking myself, how how willing am I to to consecrate myself to the point where I feel like I'm being fully obedient? So I just say to your audience, you know, consecration doesn't have to be prayer in the early hours of the morning, but it might be committing 15 minutes every day this week to reading your Bible and just reading a verse, not even a passage, just a verse, and saying, Lord, would you help me by your grace memorize this? And Lord, by your grace, would you help me apply this? And and to me, that might be the most beautiful sacrifice uh, you, c- you can give God in this season. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end the conversation on, Rob. Thank you for just what you've imparted to our listeners and those watching on YouTube today. How can people continue to follow you after this conversation? Yeah, so I, I'm trying to regularly put up content on YouTube and Instagram, which uh, my handle is Rob Wall Official on both. And uh, there's plenty of content on YouTube, various interviews I've done with um, some really gifted leaders and speakers. So I'd encourage you to, if you have time, to go check them out. I'll link to all that in the show notes. But Rob, thank you for, for joining us today. And I hope to have you back here soon in person when you come to Charlotte. For sure. Thanks for having me, Wade. All right. Thanks. That's it for our show for today. If this episode helped you in any way, would you please consider supporting the podcast just by leaving a review? That helps so much. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just like the video, share it. That's a tremendous help. And that helps us continue to bring you this content and these conversations just like the one you heard today. So I'll see you back here next week for more Dreamers and Disciples. Disciples.